Everyone, can you believe it? We were just talking about how we're coming up on the one year anniversary of being in quarantine and, and COVID and how we've all adapted, how we've changed course, how we've figured out how to do things in a different fashion. And so this is week four. This is week four of the Manager Practice webinar series. And there's only two more sessions after today. And as you can probably tell, managing your practice is an all encompassing journey, but we hope these sessions have made it more manageable, right? For you to identify and then pursue the right paths to improve your business. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. We appreciate you being here and welcome back if you've been with us over the past few weeks. I am your host, Cameo Roberson, founder of Atlas Park Consulting, a practice and business management consulting platform for financial advisors and other service-based entrepreneurs. What we do is we provide solutions to increase revenue, build sustainability, and improve efficiency. At the end of the day, our solutions help our clients clarify their business vision, move ideas from concept to profit, organize operations, escape burnout, and save time. Uh, last week, Steve Johnson, Steve, wave your hand for everyone to see you, <laughs> of Scaling Sales, talked about sales and marketing as a process within your business. Figuring out what your best action plan is and then executing it consistently with each prospective client, not having to recreate the wheel each and every time you're meeting with a prospective client. And one of the things that he mentioned is we've really got to understand that clients work with us for their reasons and not ours. And how to position ourselves to be the easy choice by finding out really what's valuable to them and then showing how we can help solve their problems. So before we get started today, um, I want to take a few moments and just thank one of our sponsors, uh, Nudge, who, let me screen share. Uh, Nudge is a tool that goes beyond the planning and makes sure the doing all gets done. It's a resource that allows financial planners to assign tasks for their clients and have shared to-do lists to manage those assigned tasks. And really provides insight into what's been done and sends automated reminders for things that are still outstanding. So at the end of today's presentation, we will be giving um, a giveaway uh, of this Nudge resource. So I'm doing something a little different, you know, you gotta mix it up a bit. And I have a poll that I'm going to throw up and I want everyone to take a minute and answer the questions. Let me know if you can see it. So how are you feeling about your business today? So, so far, what's been your best takeaway? And then how are you feeling about what you need to do moving forward? Okay, awesome. Love it, okay. And our, our speakers, you can also see the results too. And so um, it's great to see that the information has been practical, right? We wanted this to be very um, realistic for you to implement within your business. And it sounds like a lot of you are pumped and excited and have a plan of action, which is phenomenal because it's all about taking what you've learned in this series and applying it real life in your practice. Now, for those of you who are ah, mixed feelings, not sure about what to do, um, we're here as a support. And so each one of us are available uh, to you. Feel free to reach out and let us know if you have any questions because we wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to get to a better place and um, feel stronger about moving forward in your business. Any questions on this poll before I introduce our speaker? And even if something comes up a little later on in the presentation, feel free to, to share that. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll out. Thank you for participating. So as we get started, 
few housekeeping items. Um, I ask if uh, you can please mute your line if you're not speaking, that'll help us save on any background noise. Today's presentation is going to be very engaging. So add your questions to the chat box at any time and we'll moderate them. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question live if you prefer. And thanks again for your time. We really appreciate you being here. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Christy Royce of KLR Consulting. Christy helps leaders and teams recognize and tap into their full potential, develop effective communication, collaboration, and leadership skills, and ultimately achieve higher levels of performance. Her focus includes facilitating executive and team retreats, helping leaders increase their charisma and impact through presentation skills training. As I turn things over to Christy, I'd like to ask her a question. In today's rocky climate, we've been through a lot in this past year. What's gonna be required of leaders to truly impact lasting change in their organizations? Wow, what a great question, Cambio. And you know what? I think I could, I could not have set my presentation up better with that question and I didn't even beg her for that one. So I'm gonna jump right into it and say first, would love to ask all of you a question. Why do you think if leadership is more important and different in these challenging times? What is required of leaders? I'm gonna throw it right back out at all of you before I jump into it. What do you think? Well, I, I will say that leaders help the decision-making process and, and the decision-making process is really key to getting anything done. Absolutely, they're involved with the decisions. And Bruce, right to your point, it shouldn't be individual decisions, it needs to be collective decisions. So, one of the tips that I will share today is we're going to talk about communication because how do you receive the information you need to make those important decisions? It is even more arduous now because you don't have those hallway conversations that you used to have when we're walking around talking to people. So making decisions, but making decisions based on information. And you only get that through communication. What else? Steve, were you going to share something? Well, leadership, um, either intentionally or by default, they set sort of the tone and the tenor and the expectations during difficult times. And if people, you know, people, the people who are following are, 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 are um, they're impacted by that significantly, either positively or negatively. Absolutely. Are we creating stress and trauma? Or are we doing what we can to dissipate some of that? Uh, so all important parts of it. So a few things I really want to touch on today. First of all, how do you improve that communication? So it doesn't feel like the telephone game with this, with this graphic that's going one ear and out the other. With that, active listening skills. Are we asking the questions that we might not always want the answers to? And are we willing to listen to those responses and then do something with them? So it's about communication. I could talk five hours on trust. Trust to me is the key to effective leadership, effective collaboration, and effective decisions, as Bruce said earlier. So how do we build trust? Next, what about collaboration? I love this quote by John Maxwell. Working together means winning together. How do we improve our teams? My acronym for team, T-E-A-M, together everyone achieves more. How are we showing that collaboration? Because this to me is about building the foundations of the future. The future a year ago was different than the future is today and is going to be different than the future a year from now. So, my objective today is to set all of you up for success as stellar leaders to build an effective future for you, your teams, your collaborators, your partners, your clients, everybody that comes with it. So what I ask is one thing. 
I ask all of you to put your three-year-old mindset on for the next half an hour. Why would I ask that? What's a three-year-old mindset? How could that be relevant to what we're talking about today? Looking at we everything with a fresh they... set of eyes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Diane. I was saying looking at everything with a fresh set of eyes. Great. Fresh set of eyes. Absolutely. Dominic, were you saying something as well? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because I use this with my kids all the time because they're like a truth machine. You know, there's no filter. It's not complicated. It's pretty simple. Daddy's mad about something today. What's bothering you? So that's what I think of kids that they Perfect. are like a truth machine. And what is the word that a three-year-old asks all the time? Why? 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 Exactly. <laughs> that's what I want you to be thinking about today because if you can have this open perspective, look at things with fresh eyes and think about the whys, not just the what. I will guarantee you'll walk out of here with a heck of a lot more information that you can apply. So do I all have your commitment to put your three-year-old mindset on? All right, so let's go for it. So what does all this mean from my perspective? First, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the DISC assessment, but DISC is a stellar tool that helps you learn more about yourselves as a leader and learn more about your teams. The point behind DISC, it's not about people that are different are wrong. It's it about, about people that are different are different. And when you understand how to adapt and adjust your style, depending on whom you're working with, it is amazing the impact it can have. One of the things that we grew up learning is, as individuals, as kids especially, our parents always told us, golden rule, right? Treat others the way we want to be treated, not the way to communicate. And we're going to talk about why in just a minute. So when we think about successful people, there's a lot that they have in common. But number one, I talk about communication and collaboration and how do people understand themselves and how do they understand their reactions to other people? Do you really know what your strengths are? How many of you can list what your top strengths are but also list what your top strengths are? How many of you can think about what are you delegating? Are you delegating the things that you really do well? Or are you delegating the things that cause you stress? Where the assessment can come in so handy is to help you figure those things out. So really, what do you do well? I also come from a philosophy is everybody says, oh, you know, let's take the bottom 20% of the areas where you suck and improve on those things. I completely disagree. Why don't you figure out the things you're stellar at and take it from an 80% to a 90%? So what do you really do well? And then how do you adapt? I talk a lot about awareness leads to understanding, leads to acceptance, leads to change. You cannot change how you lead in different situations unless you have these other three. And that is where the DISC or any type of assessment can be extremely helpful for you. So I'm curious, how many of you are familiar with the DISC assessment or have taken the DISC assessment before? Bruce has, Diane has, Dominic has, Cameo has. What, what came from you? Omri has. What came from you when you took the DISC assessment? What did you learn as it applies to leadership? Cameo? Yeah, I learned um, <laughs> that the assessment was pretty spot on in terms of you know, describing myself. And it was really insightful to see the strengths of the other um, personality types and then how I can figure out how to work better with those other personality types. Great. Thank yeah, I'll, I'll take that, take what Cameo said a little bit more. I mean, in terms of trying to match styles to the other person, because I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that you can try to change all the rest of the world to match you, or you can change to match, you know, the other person. And, and the second is, is far more productive. Absolutely. So it can give you great insight. I'll give you an example. Well, actually, let me first, what I want to do is just quickly walk you through kind of the approach. What I'd like everybody to do is think about one person. Actually, let's think about one client. 
that you're either working with or you'd like to work with. Okay, so get that one client in your head, keeping in mind that it's we are never we can never guess completely where somebody's dots going to land because there's a lot of things that come into it. But I'm going to give you a couple tips for how you can guesstimate. So we ask two questions. Number one, are they fast paced and outspoken or are they more cautious and reflective? Okay, number two, are they more accepting and warm, more collaborative, or are they more questioning and skeptical? Okay, so two simple questions. What those questions then lead you to guess is which quadrant their dot might be placed in. So if they're fast paced and outspoken and questioning and skeptical, they're gonna be a D. Okay, and all the way around the circle. Mm. So I'll give you an example. I work with a CEO who is a very strong ID. Basically, when we talk about where everybody's dot lands in one quadrant, let me say this. And then typically the further your dot migrates to the perimeter of the circle, the more dominant you are in that style. So I think this CEO, I think he's probably way out here. He's probably one of the strongest IDs I've ever worked with in my life. So it's really interesting. And I'm just going to be really blunt here, but he will call me. He doesn't even use my name. He uses, he calls me KR. So he'll say, KR, I think I've totally effed this up. Tell me what you think. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? I love it because I don't have to tiptoe around the issues. I'll call him back and I'll say, okay, John, this is what you did right. This is what you did wrong. And this is what you need to do differently next time. Great. See you later. Bye. It's a five minute conversation. I would never coach somebody that is in the S or the I quadrant that way. So what it allows me to do when I am coaching leaders is to, to Bruce's point, I adapt my style to meet their needs. Okay, so such amazing tips you can think about from a leadership perspective. A couple tips I would just share, high D's and high C's, no news is good news. So they are not the ones that are constantly going to give you accolades. Okay. High I's and high S's, no news is bad news. High I's want to know they add value, as well as high S's. There's nothing more important to them than their work on a team. So you can imagine the challenge. High I's are looking for that feedback. High C's are saying, no, everything's fine. It's like my husband. When I'll say, how is dinner? Fine. Well, fine doesn't work for me. I want to hear it was awesome. You know, so we, there's so much we can learn from a leadership perspective. One other point I will make, high D's and high C's, trust has to be earned. High I's and high S's, you have my trust until you break it. So again, we all approach things very differently and not one style is better than another, but what this allows us to do is to learn more about ourselves, learn more about each other, and therefore you can adapt and adjust. Okay, so I'm not gonna go much more deeply into this, but one comment I would just like to share is when you think about teams, why would, you, why would I select this graphic when you think about team effectiveness or not? What comes up for you as you see this? Dominic? It looks, it looks to me like it's a balancing act that you wobble, but uh, yeah, balancing essentially. Great. It is a balancing act. It's absolutely a balancing act. And when you think about effective teams, and Kelsey, you hit the nail on the head, all members of the team don't necessarily fit together perfectly. And what, what can happen when we are hiring? We hire people we like. And you know what? Who are the people that we like? Usually the people that are similar to us. So when I work with teams, I will be honest, the teams that have the greatest success are the teams that have dots in all these four different quadrants. But that's not always what happens. 
I have a number of clients that use DISC as a hiring tool. I'm working with a law firm right now. They have four candidates they're interviewing for a COO position, and I'm taking all their final candidates through DISC because they want to know their communication style prior to onboarding. So it's an amazing tool from leadership, amazing tool when you think about how can you improve. Just And I'm happy to send these slides out to everybody as well. But just a few tips in our research, and what does this mean remotely? You know, a few things. When you're working with high Ds, as this states, ask direct questions. I say when we're working with high Ds, be prepared, be brief, and be gone. They don't want a lot of details. You know, the last thing you're going to do with a high D is send them a long email because they will never read it. Put your request for action or your call to action the first thing in the email. Okay, with high eyes, they love to think out loud. They love the, the dynamic collaboration, personal side of relationships. Give them that time. High S's, again, positive. They want schedules and routines. High S's biggest fears is biggest fears are change. So if you are going to if you are going to not respect their routines and their schedule, then we need to make certain to give them proper warning. And then high C's. I say high C's, hallway decisions, the biggest challenge that they face. Give them time. Don't pick up the phone and ask a high C their opinion. Send them an email, say, I need to speak with you about this. When can we connect? So very different tips and how you work remotely. So how does all this come into active listening? One of the things that I see in the leadership leaders that I coach is we come in with a lot of answers, but we don't always come in with a lot of questions. Big difference between open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. So I have, I'm going to pull up a tool that I am happy to send to everybody. It is a checklist that we put together that really helps us better understand what are open-ended questions that really help us achieve our goals and what value do they bring? And what are some examples of closed-ended questions? Okay. What do you think is the challenge with the use of the word why in a question? What do you see? It's accusatory. It assumes that you didn't do this right. And so people, I'm sure, become very defensive. Be exactly. It feels accusatory and people become defensive and they feel like they've done something wrong. But I can't tell you how often I see people use that question. So let me know. I'm happy to send this to you. And it's, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but there's some examples that we've put together. There's also, remember, reminding everybody, communication is only 7% words. It is 93% tone of voice and body language. So you throw Zoom into this. Wow. How much more arduous is active listening? So really think about what are the elements and the positive aspects to active listening, because there are a lot of them. And I will tell you, when we think about what we're doing differently now, it is, it is the most critical element to effective stellar leaders. And some things that you need to be thinking about. Your tone of voice. Again, body language, very different over Zoom than in person, but what do the crossed arms look like? You know, I could walk up to Cameo and I could say, Cameo, nice shirt you have on. You know, my words say one thing, but what does my tone of voice and my body language say? So really aware that active listening is not just the words. I talk about trust so extensively and the value of this. So when I say the word trust, what comes to your mind? First word, type it in the chat, feel free to speak it out. What does trust mean and how do we earn it? Valued. Valued, Diane, talk, talk more about that. <laughs> 
I think when you are asking somebody for their opinion or their suggestion on something, you're showing them that you do, you do value their opinion and that way they do believe that you trust in them. Great. Similar to what Bruce said, you know, if you're, gonna, yeah. if you're the decision maker, you need to show that you're valued by asking those questions. Uh, yeah, I would say, oh, I think Steve had his hand up, so. So, okay. uh, so unguarded. Well, I think to say one word is unguarded, right? We don't have to have our defense mechanisms up with the people we trust when we're you are when unguarded. We don't know someone. So important. It's built, building on what Steve said, it's uh, it's uh, we feel their their goals are aligned with our goals. Mm. And, and if we can do that unguarded, and we know that then then that's even you know that's that becomes the trust is I don't have to ask Steve what his goals are. I feel that we are in alignment. So now I can trust what he says and his advice. Absolutely. Your goals are aligned and you ask those open-ended questions to define those goals. You know, I'm, and this is why I'm pulling all three of these things together. You've got the disc because we're communicating differently. You're asking the right questions. What does that lead to? You're building trust so that your goals are aligned so that you understand that where different people's perspectives are coming from. You really have that stellar communication. What else about trust is important? How do you feel trusted or how do you find that you trust others in the work that you do? And let's talk about clients for a minute because I know a lot of us are here for business development. So what do you do to establish that trust with clients? I can share from my experience. Um, when I start working with a new client, which is, of course, I don't have a history with them. Um, I try to share all the options that are available to them and help them make the decision that this is the best decision rather than sharing what I think is the best, um, giving them an option that, okay, these are the options and this is my suggestion. Um, so they can make the decision. Of course, I let them decide uh, and not force them. So um, they feel that I bought them all the solutions that are available to them. Um, and of course, I'm sharing from my experience that this could be the best plan for them uh, for the health insurance. That's what I do. Um, so making like empowering them and then of course, sharing my experience and letting them decide um, to earn the trust. Thanks so much, Amrit. That's such a great point. And Robert says, speaking with transparency. I mean, that's really, I think, what Amrit is saying, is that how can you be transparent from the beginning? Kelsey, great point. Follow through. How many, you know, sorry, but I'm going to say this. I talked to, I had a troika with provisors yesterday. Some of you are provisors members and some of you are not. But uh, I will just share, there was one person in Provisors that tried to reach out to give somebody a referral. Never heard back from them. You know, it's like she said to me, because she knows I'm a group leader. She said, Christy, what would you do in that situation? I'm like, number one, I'd never refer in business again. But, you know, follow through is something that is really important, whether it be with clients, whether it be with colleagues. I mean, that to me is a big key to trust. So Kelsey, thank you for bringing that up. What else? lead you to either trust or distrust people. To well, add to, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, to add to what Amrit was um, sharing, you know, giving my clients all of the options and always trying to act in their best interest and showing them how the solutions that I provide can meet various needs that they have and then letting them figure out what's the best path to take. So important. Well, and I'm hearing a lot of things that, again, so align with the work that I do. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the concept from Patrick Lencioni's book. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I will tell you, if you have not read this book, it is a must read for anybody that works with individuals or anybody who has a relationship, quite honestly. But if you look at this, the only way that you are going to get these stellar results, if you look at the bottom of this pyramid, 
It is healthy, engaged trust. The way that this concept works is when you have healthy trust, all of what we're talking about, it leads to conflict, which is positive. When there is trust, conflict is not about you're right and I'm wrong, or let's put our boxing gloves on and we're going to work through this. Conflict is healthy. Conflict is engaged. Conflict is let's put all the stuff out on the table and we can agree to disagree, but because egos are not in the way and we trust each other, that conflict is a conversation leading to a greater commitment versus conflict is you're right and I'm wrong and egos get in the way. Then when you have that commitment, everybody knows what direction you're going in. Accountability is easy because there's alignment, there's agreement, there's commitment but you are not gonna get these stellar results that you're looking for for yourselves, for your relationships, or for your clients, unless it starts here with trust. Again, Patrick Leoncioni, five dysfunctions of the team. I use this a lot in my practice, stellar, stellar tool to help you be more effective as leaders. So then with all of this, and I think everybody kind of tiptoed around this word, but the word to me that allows us to build these trusting relationships is vulnerability. And my definition of vulnerability is this willingness to, to let our guard down, admit flaws and ask for help. Sometimes it works when I ask my husband to do the dishes, sometimes it doesn't, but at least I ask. <laughs> so, or my daughter, quite honestly. So we think about this, how often are you are vulnerable? Are you vulnerable with everybody? What does it take for you to have that comfort level to be vulnerable? So if we go back to the DISC assessment for a minute in thinking about the different sides, do you think there is a particular style that could be more challenging for you to be vulnerable with? I know there's one for me. I am a high I with a secondary D. And the hardest individuals for me to be vulnerable with and sometimes even communicate with, quite honestly, are the high C's. The reason being, the high C's always ask the questions. And darn it, if I don't have the answers, I feel like an idiot. <laughs> so what I need to do, and I've learned over the years, is I take those questions as a positive. Just say, you know what, it's not telling me that I'm an idiot or that I don't know. It's they're asking me the questions to ensure that whatever I'm communicating, whatever I'm delivering is going to be stellar. So I look forward to those questions, but I will be honest and humbly, it's taken me years to feel that sense of vulnerability sometimes with those that are in that high seat quadrant. Because I feel that their questions, they, I used to feel their questions are somewhat threatening. So I ask all of you to think about which is a style that you might have a challenge communicating with and then how does vulnerability play into that? Really important part of all of this when we think about leadership and leadership from a different perspective. When we think about teams that we- Hey, hey, hey Christy, actually, I've got a question on that. Please, please. Um, Thank you. A couple you. questions. So what's the most common um, sort of uh, mismatch? I apologize if you mentioned this before, but like what's- where, where do you most commonly see the mismatch between types of people or why might um, somebody be hesitant? If Great you question, Steve. And, you know, I'm going to go back here for a minute because I think this can be really helpful for us. Okay. If we go back to the different styles, where we find the most challenging communication typically is somebody that's completely opposite us. So the D's and the S's are going to have the hardest time communicating and collaborating because they have nothing in common. 
you know, mm -hmm. being in the eyes and the C's are going to have the most common challenge communicating and collaborating. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is, you know, high D's, big strength is their directness, but also that directness when it comes, when it turns into a weakness is they are forceful and blunt. When you mm -hmm. think about it, high S's are accepting and warm and fearful of change and fearful of conflict. So the high D's are coming in like, like a train and the high S's are like, whoa, hold back a minute here. So they can have challenges. The okay. I's and the C's, and I think the example I gave around that is a good one. We just think very differently. Mm -hmm. High C's can view high S's warmness and their enthusiasm and their cheerleader optimism style is fake. Okay. So especially when it comes to trust, that can be a challenge mm -hmm. between high C's and high I's. Does mm -hmm. that answer mm -hmm. your question? Yep, that's that's definitely helpful. Um, what happens? Um, what happens when things? And maybe you're going to cover this, but what happens when things devolve into conflict, right? And so people um, uh, start to, you know, they 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 start to get really sort of um, forceful at at loggerheads about this stuff. And I guess it could be. Uh, diametrically, but also that, you know, the, the up in the upper left there too, you could get two people there that are just butting heads. You know, what, what can you say about that and, and avoiding that? Are there any general rules or guidelines there? Bring me in to help. That would be my first yeah. response. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, Steve, and I'll highlight a couple things. I would say, you know, two high Ds is the example I used with John, my client, can mm -hmm. get along very well if there's trust. If there is not trust, it is put your boxing gloves on because egos get in the way. Okay. So I know that doesn't directly answer your question, but I would say my more direct answer is you have got to uncover where that conflict is starting from. Mm -hmm. If you can, and that's where assessments are really helpful, you know, even disc assessment. I mean, five dysfunctions of a team has a stellar assessment. It helps people figure it out and it gives them the language to talk through it. It's not Steve and Christy aren't getting along and there's a lot of conflict. It's, oh, now I get it. Steve approaches conflict differently than Christy does. And here's some tips on how we can overcome that. But first, you have got to dig up the stones that have been buried for so long. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest to all of you. I am finding with my clients what is happening is that we have been burying the stuff for a long time with COVID, with the additional challenges at leadership virtually, I'm finding it bubbling up, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we are finding is that we have got to address it and you have got to pull it up to help, to help uncover where it's starting from before you start to address it. Can I jump in and add something, Christy? Thanks. <laughs> um, Christy did the disc for my entire team and actually um, even for two candidates uh, several candidates that I was considering hiring. We ended up bringing two of them on, um, but I had an existing issue with a current teammate, a younger teammate, and going through the DISC profile and understanding the quadrants that each of my team members was in, so four other people besides me, was enlightening, and the young person, I'm a high D, the young person is a high I out there, um, but pre-COVID, our desks were next to each other, so I could actually watch and hear and see everything she was doing all day. So my trust was there because I was kind of hovering over her. But with COVID, all of a sudden, I didn't have that. And it was really challenging for me. And it became that it eroded the trust we had built over three years because I couldn't see the work being done in the system, right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't see things moving in a system. So now that I can't see her and I can't see things moving in the system, I'm like, well, clearly she's not working, right? Uh, she's taking advantage of you know, working from home. Um, and so through Christy's work and going through the disc, we actually realized with the high I, she wants to feel so valued, right? She is, that's so important to her. And so the plan that we came up with was that I have a separate check-in meeting with her every week. It usually, it was scheduled for 30 minutes. They've ended up going an hour. And we really just look at her desk and what she's focused on, make sure we're on the same page. It always ends on a positive note. And I'm seeing things moving. She knows why, 
my trust was eroding. She needs to keep the systems up to date with all the work that she's doing. Because if the systems aren't date, I can't see it anymore on Zoom. So for us, it's been a wonderful way to address where there was trust, eroding trust, and a DNI and I can figure that out through communication. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Check the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you I saved the day. <laughs> you saved the day. I was on no, the verge of firing her because I was <laughs> sure she wasn't working. <laughs> so. Well, and I think that's a great example because we assume. And again, great segue into a couple of my closing comments here. And that is the challenge with trust also. Let me pull all these up. Is that I have this equation that we put together. And that is trust is when you have the credibility you know when people believe that you're the subject expert you are reliable you're getting the work done and you are authentic that's going to lead to trust but a big part of this equation is you need to have the perception that this person has team interest in mind not self-interest in mind if you think, and this is great with Amrit's question or Amrit's comment about putting together, putting together proposals that have the client's needs in mind. If the client thinks that she's just selling for her to sell, for her to make more money, then they're not gonna trust you. So this is a really important equation that, equation that adds on to the vulnerability to really think about it. If, when Diane first thought that her employee was only working four hours a day, again, they, she thought that the self-interest was in mind, not the team interest. But sometimes it's just digging up those stones and figuring out how to address it. Make sense? It does. Uh, Christy, question for you. As I think about my own business, as I think about the financial services professionals who are here, and when we're looking to work with prospective clients and understand their communication style, how can we use this DISC tool um, to, to make a stronger connection with them as we're looking to help them uh, achieve their, their goals? Great question, Cameo. And I would say go back to those two questions I gave you on people reading. You know, if you can okay. kind of guesstimate. And then I also would say, gosh, if you have any interest, take the DISC assessment yourself because there's a lot of quick tips in that assessment that will help you better understand. You know, and I'm happy to provide that for anybody that's on the call. So that can be really helpful. Um, actually, the management version of the DISC assessment, it gets into how do you delegate? How do you motivate? how you develop or train people, and then how do you work with your manager and your clients? So it could, that in itself will help you gain additional insight. So, and, and it's specific. So for the managers, what was really enlightening is it's, it, you know, I have somebody that's an S, somebody that's an I, somebody that's a C. From the manager's perspective, it focuses on each quadrant separately, right? The other quadrant. So it's not just, oh, as a manager, do this. Very specific for I's need this, S needs this, C's needs this. Very, very helpful for me. Thank you. So well, that in itself, or just again, you know, I'm happy, like I said, I'm happy to send out my slides, those two questions to think about, are they introverted or extroverted? Are they more collaborative or questioning? Gives you some good tips in itself. Also watch their emails. If you're getting four paragraph emails with a bunch of details, they're a high C, they're not a high D. If you're getting an email saying, see you at 11 o'clock today, they're probably not a high C. So if, if the emails are, hi, Cameo, hope your weekend's going great, blah, 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 blah. You know, the fun part, the collaborative part, they're probably gonna be on the right side of the circle. So there's a lot of just fun tips you can look for that will help you get to them as well. So how do we pull all this together? I mentioned earlier, the golden rule is wrong. So what rule are we living by today? Christy calls it the platinum rule, which is treat others the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated. So all of this, active listening, using assessment, thinking about trust, all of this comes together when we think about how do you build stellar leadership skills and how are they even more critical 
as we think about what we've passed over the last year and what's to come over the next year. A question that I ask everybody to think about is every interaction that you have the rest of the day today, will everyone feel better? What are you doing to nurture these relationships and show your leadership skills? There was also a great blog today. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Chip Conley, but he's one of my favorite authors. He has a daily blog. If not, let me know and I'll forward you the link because he is there always a hundred words or less. So easy to read, he's fabulous. But he had one today that I thought was so relevant I had to share. He said, be good soil. When you are good soil, you are the catalyst for growth and regeneration for everything and everyone around you. He used the analogy of soil because soil is full of nutrients and richness. So are, people, are you good soil? Are you good soil for everyone around you? So what do we do to close this out today? What I ask everybody to really think about is what is your plan? It's easy to sit through these things and then not do anything with it. So I want you all to think about three categories. What have you learned today? And what have you learned from our fabulous prior speakers as well that you are already doing well, you wanna continue? What are you, what did you learn that might be different you might want to start? And what did you learn that maybe you're not doing so well you want to stop? Again, if we put our three-year-old mindset on and think about what can be different when you leave this meeting today, I really do encourage you to write some things down. Research proves that you will be nine times more effective if within an hour you write down some goals. So write them down. Remember that people are your most valuable asset. And I really encourage you to have some fun with this. So thank you so much for your time, for your sharing, for your attention. Um, again, here to support in any way that I can and uh, look forward to hearing back about all the success that you have based on all of the great programs that Cameo has hosted. Cameo, thank you for the opportunity. My pleasure, Christy. Thank you so much for that engaging presentation. Wow, there's a lot of content in there. How can we get a copy of the slides for the, in the uh, worksheet that you um, that you shared? Happy to send them out. So um, my email address is Christy. It's K R I S T I at K L R Consulting dot com. Shoot me an email. I can, I'll send you the slides. I'll send you that worksheet. You know, any part of this that you're interested in, happy, happy to share. Okay, fantastic. Any questions? Any other questions from the audience today? I'll make a comment too um, that we used Christy for not just pre screening potential candidates uh, for us as well, but once we made our hires, we were going from a team of three to five. So we bought Christian to do two separate working lunches for us, one in each of the first two months that these new employees were joining the team. And we focused on the results of the assessment and really looked at the strengths and weaknesses. It was such a wonderful way to onboard new employees into a team. They really felt... I was really shocked actually at how powerful it was because in debriefing with them, they all said, we worked at our previous firms for you know nine years, 10 years. We've never felt more connected than we have with our team at Cal and we've only been here eight weeks. Like that's pretty mind blowing, right? They actually know us, they know who we are, we know them, we're figuring out how we're communicating and they never got that in years at their other agencies. So this is pretty powerful stuff that Christie's doing. And if you're having team issues or onboarding new people, I can't encourage you enough to, to engage in the DISC process and really go through more than just getting your assessment and understanding it. You can use it to really shape and form your teams. Thanks. Thank you for sharing, Diane. So as we get ready to close out this week's session, uh, we have two more weeks to go. And our very next uh, presenter, uh, Ben Douglas, Ben, raise your hand. 
Say hello to everyone. Will be with us next week. So Ben is uh, an attorney who provides legal counsel in all areas of asset management for registered investment advisors. And he's gonna be talking about how to avoid regulatory scrutiny by using a solid investment management agreement. As an operations consultant myself, I see this a lot with my clients is they will share contracts. They will share engagement letters amongst investment advisors. And that's not always the best thing to do. And you wanna make sure that you're putting in yourself to avoid that regulatory scrutiny. So he's gonna be sharing a lot of information uh, next week. So make sure that you're, you're back here next week. And then closing out the series uh, will be myself and my colleague, Ariel Minicozzi. So Diane talked a little bit about how the colleague she was working with she wasn't using um, the system in a way that Diane could really identify her doing work in a productive manner. And so we're gonna be talking about how to build the right systems and automation into your practice so that things are seamless, things are efficient and everyone has visibility of what's going on. And so get your questions together. I'm gonna to ask Christy to uh, share some final thoughts with us. She has an event that's coming up. And then we will, be, we will be back next week for another fun-filled uh, event. We really appreciate you being here. I can't wait for Ben's presentation next week. I know I certainly need it. So Ben, so looking forward to that. Yeah, just one final comment that I would like to share. If any of you are not familiar with Financial Women of San Francisco, March 8th, they have a great event coming up. Um, if you look at the keynote speaker, wow, um, fabulous presentation, a seat at the decision-making table. Um, all, also, I am facilitating a breakout that I'm really excited about, it, about a powerful virtual presentations and conversations. So uh, I know the men are going, gosh, can I go? Probably just come and, come and register. We'd love to have you there. And uh, if you know anybody that would be interested, again, let me know and I'm happy to forward you the link. Um, it's very reasonably priced and some great events that are going on. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, everyone, week four is in the books. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, share this information with other colleagues. You can still register um, all the way up until March 9th, the day before the final session. And let's continue to build upon all of the information that's been shared with our experts to date so that we can really uh, improve the way we do business. There's no reason we have to continue to struggle. We are here uh, for support. So if you have questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to get you what you need. So until next week, everyone have a great rest of your week and we'll see you soon. Thank you.